Suzanne takes you down to her place near the river. This is important. This isn't like some kind of thing of, you know, the nine day wonder diet. This is about saving the planet and helping to raise the consciousness of humanity. And also it's about a liberation movement. When we bring the animals in, this is the first liberation movement in the history of the world in which the oppressed group cannot participate. So we're totally doing it for them. That was Victoria Moran, our guest for today's podcast. And you want to travel with her and you want to travel blind and you know that she will trust you. Hello, I'm Suzanne Taylor and welcome to my podcast, Searching for Unity in Everything, Meaningful Conversations with Meaningful People. How can we turn this world around? Can we turn this world around? Everything I do is in that pursuit, buoyed up by that famous quote by Margaret Mead, never doubt that a small group of thoughtful, committed citizens can change the world. Indeed, it's the only thing that ever has. My guest today is Victoria Moran. The times cry out for heroism that's grounded in truth-telling and in caring about the whole world. And my guests are people who inspire me with their heroism. Victoria Moran is at the top of my list. Decades ago, I wrote the Anybody Can Make It, Everybody Will Love It cookbook, a hardback book with no dietary restrictions. So the status Victoria has as a high priestess in the vegan world isn't just what got her here, but it's who she is as a human being that did it. We became friends 20 years ago when a publicist arranged for me to host her on a book tour promoting one of her 13 books, I think it was Shelter for the Spirit, about how to spiritualize your home, which I believe is what got her one of her two appearances on Oprah. Here's an excerpt from a blog post of hers, written June 1, 1999, about my house where she stayed when we did that program about Shelter for the Spirit. I am visiting my friend Suzanne, who lives in heaven, not harps and angels heaven, Earth heaven. She has created in her home, tucked away in the hills of West Hollywood, something of a cross between Eden and fantasy land. Her back patio and garden is a colorful jungle of everything that blooms. Oranges hang from tree branches. The pool reflects the Spanish tiles and the bright sky. Inside is all color and whimsy. When I'm here, I have architectural contentment. Well, I'm sorry we aren't on video, so you can see what she was talking about, plus how beautiful Victoria is. Ah, well, from writing books on weight loss and well-being and spirituality, and after 35 years on a vegan diet, veganism became Victoria's top advocacy. And her latest books are Main Street Vegan, which draws people into that lifestyle, and the Main Street Vegan Academy cookbook. The Vegan Academy, which is supported by her Main Street Vegan podcast, is Victoria's creation to train and certify vegan lifestyle coaches and educators. We'll let Victoria have a little soapbox about enrolling in that. One more thing to say by way of intro is that when What on Earth, a documentary I made about Crop Circle some 10 years ago, played in New York City, I spent my three weeks in Manhattan staying in Victoria's apartment, where I walked out her door one morning to pick up the New York Times and found a great review of my film. On our podcast page, I'll post my over-the-top reaction to reading it in my nightie with no makeup, so it's slightly embarrassing that was caught on video. A more complete bio of Victoria is on our podcast page, but for a few other noteworthy factoids, her Main Street Vegan Radio Show podcast was awarded the Outstanding Vegan Media Outlet Award in 2015 and noted by Feedspot in 2019 as number three in the top 25 vegan podcasts. She's the lead producer and is prominent on camera in a documentary, a Prayer for Compassion, to introduce vegan living to people of faith that's playing in theaters now. And most charming of all, PETA, which is People for the Ethical Treatment of Animals, 
for 2016-17, voted for Victoria as PETA's sexiest vegan over 50. <laughs> so, Victoria, before we get into what made you who you are, why don't you have a little say about what I mentioned? Any corrections? Oh, my goodness. No, it was stunning. <laughs> Thank right, well, you. But I love that you found the thing that I wrote about your home, which is absolutely sensational. Main Street Vegan is my brand for this time in my life, probably for the rest of my life. So that's what I'm up to. Yeah, yeah. No, I know. Uh, I, you're just the queen out there in vegan land. I know it. Uh, why don't you talk about the Academy? Why don't I give you a little soapbox here and, oh, and enroll I'm people? Yeah. Well, you know, those of you who are listening, and if you're a, a fan of Suzanne, uh, I know you come from the spiritual side of things and not the vegan side of things. But if you happen to be vegan, and you wanted to take your vegan outreach to the next level, then what we do at Main Street Vegan Academy is train and certify vegan lifestyle coaches and educators. And what we learned after really our first class or two back in 2012 was, if it weren't too lengthy, that should say coaches, educators, and entrepreneurs. Because a lot of people come to our intensive in New York City. It's only six days. I always want to make sure it's a magnificent, life-changing experience. But it's not Harvard. It's six days in, in New York City to be immersed in, in the principles principles of veganism, also communication and, and business principles to really take this to the next level. And of course, we have wonderful field trips and incredible luminous um, faculty. And what's really cool about it, and Suzanne, what really kind of makes me feel like I'm a little bit following in your footsteps is that Main Street Vegan Academy, the academic portions of the program happen in my home, just like all these amazing things that you've been doing for decades happen in your amazing home. And today we have 420 graduates from 28 countries on six continents. And so it's just like you've talked about for all these years with Mighty Companions, one person reaching another. There are hundreds of people now all over the world carrying this message of kindness and sustainability that just makes me feel like even though I'm never going to have grandchildren, I've been told, I have all these, these other kind of uh, godchildren out there who've been to Main Street Vegan Academy. So thank you for asking about it. Well, you're definitely in the swim of what's getting more and more popular. I know I'm surrounded by vegans. At some point, I may have to succumb. <laughs> and and say, you want to say a little bit about this movie also? I know it's being played in this kind of tug thing where movies go into commercial theaters for a limited run, one day runs, you know, do you yeah. want to say, say what's going on? Because I know you have a sure. schedule all over the country now. Oh, thank you. Well, the film is called A Prayer for Compassion, and it has a page on my website, MainStreetVegan.net, if you wanted to see the trailer and, and learn a little more and, and see where it is um, playing. But I was contacted actually on my radio show. My podcast is an internet radio show on Unity Radio first and then becomes a podcast. And so a gentleman back in 2015 called in on a day that we had a book giveaway and he also left a message with the engineer. And when I called him back, he asked after pleasantries, would you produce my documentary? And my thought, you know, that's a little bit like, would you remove my appendix? It's like, uh, I've never done that before. But then he said, it's a documentary about spirituality and veganism. Well, he had made me an offer that I couldn't refuse, and it's been such an adventure. And the adventure continues. I mean, we'll be going digital in the fall, and that's really when lots of eyes uh, will we'll look at this film, which basically answers the question, okay, we know Beyonce wants you to go vegan. What about God? Does this, this great beneficence, whatever we want it, have any interest in our food choices. And so Thomas, the filmmaker, goes all over the U.S. He goes to the climate conference in Morocco. He travels throughout India asking this question. 
And uh, I think he finds some pretty intriguing answers. Well, it's a very classy film. It's, it doesn't have that kind of underground, you know, improv kind of look to it. It really is well done. In fact, I might say too well done because some of what we're doing with animals, where really the main thrust of the film is about being a compassionate human being and how can you be that and be party to what the way animals are treated. It is so compelling, really. You know, if you get uh, an audience of people who aren't vegans, you can have a lot more vegans in the world after they see this movie. We do need to be looking at, at diet, whether people want to cut back some or go all the way to vegan. That's just something that's in, in front of everybody's space right now. But so what we've seen is particularly some people that are more of the new age, or I guess now we're calling it the now age, um, you know, who have basically said things like, well, I'll, I'll pray for the soul of the animal. They see this and it all comes together like, okay, you know, that was okay back when I could believe that. But now I'm going to have to actually make some changes in my choices. And, you know, it's been very, very gratifying uh, to me as a producer, even though I can't take credit for the artistry, that all belongs to Thomas Jackson, the filmmaker. But I've been so blessed uh, to be part of it for three and a half years and now going forward into distribution. So. Well, you never do fail to impress me with how you keep expanding your field, you know, and I, I, Victoria has produced a movie <laughs> when, when it first came to my attention. Oh, my goodness. But got, good job, girl. And you're very good in it also. You're okay. really lovely on camera. So everybody who can't see you here, go see her movie. Well, all that information will be on our podcast, you know, where people will get links so that they'll know what we're talking about here. So let's go back and now and talk about you. Uh, how, how, where did all this come from? I mean, what, what kind of childhood did you have yeah, that led a, you to being this person that you are today? I was very lucky in that my guru showed up when I was six months old. So my parents worked before there was daycare and they had this string of nannies with all these horror stories. One had me packed in a car and was about to kidnap me and my mother just had this sort of psychic impression, you better go home and see what's happening with the baby. So after all of this history, um, this woman uh, was, was introduced to them and the minute I saw her, the story goes as my little infant arms went up and I said, Dee Dee, as if I had known her in another life, and I'm sure I did. So she was involved in all sorts of spiritual things. She was very active in unity, which I'm still active in. My radio shows on the Unity online network. Uh, but she'd been in Rosicrucians, and, and she knew about yoga, and she read Emerson. And so this is what she raised me with. So I have never a day in my life not believed in reincarnation, because that was presented to me early on as a very logical possibility of, of how life works cosmically. And so uh, Didi really raised me with all these ideas. Um, you know, even I think that the vegan thing was birthed with her. She was not personally vegetarian, but when I came home from first grade with the four food groups, and she was one of these people who didn't like the government telling people what to do. And she said, <laughs> I could, I could take you to a restaurant where you could have a, a hamburger made out of peanuts and you'd think you were having beef. You know, this was the 1950s, but the Unity headquartered in Kansas City had a, a vegetarian restaurant at that time. Uh, and she also said there are some people who never eat meat, they're called vegetarians. So that word kind of took up residence in my head. And so many of these other concepts that I was able to just go out later and, and study and, and learn. So when I, I did go to college, I, I went late. I had some life before college, moving to London and writing for teen magazines. And Paul McCartney bought me a scotch and Coke. So I had some interesting youthful experiences. But ultimately, I ended up in college studying comparative religions. And I, I'd been writing since I was 14. I started writing for the first teen magazine, you know, really a, as a kid. And everybody said, well, why aren't you majoring in journalism? And I thought, well, I already know how to do that. I, you know, like Einstein said, I want to know God's thoughts. The rest is commentary. So I think that's pretty a, much what got me here. What a great quote. 
you know what, <laughs> just a little aside here, talking about comparative religion. You know, I was a really good student. I'm Phi Beta Kappa. I graduated summa cum laude from NYU. I only got a B in one class ever, and it was comparative religion. Oh, no. <laughs> I always thought, what a funny commentary for how my life has turned out and look where I didn't do it well in college. You know, this anyway. is so interesting because I got a B and it was anatomy and physiology. And I'm totally fascinated with health and health promotion and all that. So, you know, maybe our Bs are where our, um, our destinies lie. We're That's so much for academia, you know, we've moved on in the world into the yeah. bigger world of spirit and consciousness and what have you. Uh, so, so did, did you acquire, now were you a vegetarian always based on six yeah. months? I tried uh, when I was 13 and I had no idea what vegetarians ate. I knew they didn't eat meat, but I translated that as, well, they must eat cottage cheese and fruit cocktail. So I ate that for about six months. I lost some weight, my skin cleared up, but I got really, really hungry. Uh, and then when I was 15, I transferred out of biology class because I didn't want to cut up animals. And my teacher said, uh, but you eat meat, don't you? And I was just devastated. It's like, oh, my God, you, you found out my deep, dark secret. It's like, I do now, but I won't always. And he looked at me with this very kind of knowing look. And he said, you know what? I believe you. And he signed my slip. And I, I got to go into human science, which everybody said, you know, that's not college prep. You know, you'll be homeless. Um, I'm okay. Um, and then I actually went vegetarian based on getting into yoga, which I started reading about at 17. There were three books in the Kansas City Public Library. You probably read them all, Yoga, Youth, and Reincarnation, uh, Indra Devi's Yoga for Americans, and then uh, a yogi had come from India and, um, and, and wrote this big, big blue book full of all kinds of postures and they were just like what but I just kept reading these books and, and they all suggested that if you're going to be serious about yoga you needed to be vegetarian so just not eating meat and and after the first like nine months it was all all animals meat and fish that was not hard for me but when I did hear about vegan that was super hard because I had a binge eating disorder and I would go to the 7-eleven in the middle of the night and read the labels and they all had egg albumin, you know, or, or whey or something, you know, in, in all the junk food. And I had a heck of a time and it took me years to get from vegetarian to vegan, but it all goes, everything goes back to spirituality for me. As you know, I, I, I have this eating disorder. I got into 12 step recovery, which is the most spiritual thing, although certainly not the most woo woo thing I've ever done in my life, but the most honestly spiritual thing I didn't have to eat for a fix anymore. And then when I could make the choice, I began. And still out of that same conviction that animals were, you know, not to be in, engaged in. Yeah, it, it always was the animals for me. And what's really interesting, well, there are lots of reasons uh, why people choose to go vegan. I think it's a little bit like uh, the price is right. You know, the you open the door and you think you're only getting refrigerator, but there's just all this other stuff uh, back there. You know, there's, there's vegan fashion, there's vegan travel. There's just, I mean, it's really an amazing world. I mean, it's certainly what we've seen in the past week investment. I mean, the biggest IPO of, uh, of 2019 was Beyond Meat just last month. But the real reasons that people go vegan or move in, in this direction is either animal ethics, which you had asked me if that was my motivation, and it absolutely was, or health, or the environment. And what's so fascinating on the health part is some people go vegan to save their lives. Because we have known since Dean Ornish uh, published his landmark work back in 1990 that a low-fat, plant-based diet 
can actually reverse heart disease. Nobody before that believed it was even possible. And then there was follow-up work at the Cleveland Clinic. We know now without a doubt that if somebody is willing to eat this way, even with advanced heart disease, which is the biggest killer of women and men in the country, it can be not just prevented, it can be turned around. And it's such a funny thing that you've got some people who are doing this because they really are at death's door and, and they find this is this great salvation. So what's really strange about this whole thing is that you have some people changing their diet to become completely plant-based to literally save their lives. And then you have other people who want to do it for ethical or environmental reasons, and then they worry, am I going to get enough protein? Yes. The answer is absolutely yes. Uh, will I get enough calcium? Yes, you'll get enough of that too. Nobody ever asks about B12. That is one thing you actually do have to supplement because B12 is made by bacteria, and uh, you can get that in animal products and, and not plants. So take your B12. I consider it my little tiny rent that I pay for getting to have this wonderful lifestyle. And it, it's kind of magical. Once you sort of step on the roadway, it's kind of like the um, uh, at the L, uh, airport you step on that sidewalk that's moving and it might not get you all the way to your gate, but it's going to get you uh, closer than where you started with a lot less effort than you might have otherwise expended. You know, it's funny. I think some people have an impression that if you don't eat meat, you're kind of uh, low energy, you know, and I'm here we are. I can see you, although the audience can't. And you're about the most vital, you know, electrified person. So you're such a good spokesperson for the virtues of vegan without any detriments. Uh, it you know, one of the questions I like to ask is about a sense of destiny or a sense of mission. And does that tie in for you now with being this vegan um, soapbox? Uh, you know, I, I really do. And what's interesting to me is that in the early part of my life, the first 33 years of my life, my biggest problem was food, food and my weight and how I saw myself. And the fact that just the way the universe operates in this just incredibly perfect way that now I'm able to take the final third of my life and devote it to healing people and animals in the planet through food choices, even though my youth was kind of taken up with an unhealthy relationship with food. So, you know, there's always some God in there somewhere. It's absolutely perfect. You know, I also think of you uh, as one of my friends who was a chubby girl, as I was. I used to have to go buy chubbies at the time. That's what they did in uh, clothing world when I was a little girl. My mom used to take me to the chubbies department. <laughs> Somehow I've been miraculously thin for all my adult life, but I'm always thinking of it as somewhat of a miracle. Uh, so you think that, you know, this, I, I could see that you are going to be the person of all people who's going to switch the world to vegan lifestyle. I'm, I'm nervous about that because I do like my meat. <laughs> well, the world is changing, Suzanne, to the point that some of these plant meats are utterly amazing. Now, I've eaten vegetables for so long that I like things like Buddha bowls, you know, where there's some, some greenery and then some rice and some beans and some, you know, cilantro sprinkled on top. I mean, I've just, that's how I eat these days. And that seems good to me and very satisfying. And yet some of these meat like products are so amazing. My adorable husband, you know, when I was younger and I only dated like vegetarians and spiritual people, but they proved to be kind of fragile sometimes. And so when I met William, uh, just shortly uh, before I met you, I thought, what does it matter? You know, he, he's an agnostic and he eats everything. It's not like we're going to get married or anything. But we did. The vegan thing uh, took a while. Now he's totally on, on board with all of it. But I think that there's, there's just this idea that if you've got a purpose or lots of purposes, you know, I think that's the other thing when you talk about destiny. In different times in our lives, 
our destiny seems very, very tied in with what we're doing then. So certainly, I mean, you're a mom, I'm a mom. So when I was raising my daughter, that seemed like my highest destiny. Even though I was also writing books, you know, I wrote my biggest book yet, Creating a Charmed Life, when she was about 14. Um, so, you know, we have kind of side gigs going on, but I think our destiny is kind of always focused uh, in one particular place, depending on where we are in life. And right now, for me, the destiny is create a vegan world and, um, you know, just be here to watch these amazing products like Beyond Meat taste so good. You know, there's another one called the Impossible Burger that they're serving now at Burger King. And there's something of a scandal here in New York City because they couldn't get enough Impossible Burgers. So they just put meat burgers on the bun and gave them to people in the Impossible Wrapper. So, you know, if that had happened to me, oh my goodness, be still my beating heart. I haven't had animal flesh in 50 years. You know, perhaps I would have swooned to death. But on the other hand, the idea that regular Burger King customers are getting a veggie burger and not even thinking it tastes funny means we've come a long way. And oh, yes. Sauce, I guess beyond, beyond. <laughs> For sure. Well, is there anything still on your bucket list? It seems like you've accomplished so much. I even remember that the Charmed Life book was so wonderful. That seemed like it could, could go off in a whole other direction. There were daily practices in there, weren't they? Each, each thing was some wonderful thing. And I remember you and I talked years ago about, well, maybe we could start a whole world where everybody was doing the same practice every day or something. I don't know, Victoria, you got a whole bunch of accomplishments behind you. Oh, you're fine. Well, people are doing a lot of those. Everybody in the world do something. I know there's something here in New York where everybody's supposed to read the same book. I think, you know, there's something kind of cosmic about that. I mean, to me, it's all a spiritual adventure. So right now, I'm not specifically writing, speaking in the spiritual world quote. And yet I'm I'm doing this other thing that to me is, is like a heart assignment. So it's, it's a soul's work. And I think when you just start to see the world from a magical perspective, as you have for all these years, I mean, you are absolutely one of my role models for all of this. You just can't get up in the morning and say, eh, what does it matter? Same old, same old. No, because you have a purpose. And I think if we hang around people, both in real life and through podcasts like this and online and wherever we can get hold of these other inspiring people, it, it just helps us to keep our, our energy up and, and keep our vision where it needs to be. Well, I think we're actually very lucky that we do have a sense of purpose because uh, I think people, I think that's why when people retire from their jobs, they don't like, but at least it gives them something to do every day. A lot of, a lot of people and a lot of people, you know, die quickly when they retire because they don't have anything else that's kind of pulling them along. But I'm, I'm so grateful that I care, you know, that it matters to me that we live in a better world. And, you know, the thing that I'm always looking for is, uh, it's, it's such a complicated world. So these gears are so enmeshed in the way it is. What could actually change things significantly? And now, of course, we're in danger because, you know, things are uh, challenging the survival of humanity now, global warming and other major issues. And do you, do you, have, do you think about things that could be dramatic it could come along and actually, that was what I, why I got involved in crop circles, of course, and you know all about that, um, where if we actually knew there were other, there's a, some other intelligence in the universe aside from ourselves, wow, wouldn't that change our mindset about being the big honchos and the supreme beings in the universe? Uh-oh, all of a sudden we'd have to have some humility and wouldn't that be good for us and all the ways in which arrogance doesn't serve us very well. But do you have any, you know, I'm always probing people for what, what, what could we do? What could, what could shift everything? Yeah. Is there something well, that comes to you? I would say the number one thing is to go vegan as soon as possible, because we know from the United Nations Food and Agriculture organization, um, Livestock's Long Shadow Report, way back in 2006, animal agriculture puts more greenhouse gases into the environment than all transportation combined. And you live there in LA, you see those freeways. 
more than all of that and the airplanes and the everything else, animal agriculture. Now, the World Bank was unsure about that figure and said, you know what, we're going to do our own study because we're just not sure about this. And what they found out was not only was it true, but it was true to a far greater extent than even the FAO study had seen because the FAO had not been looking at the fossil fuels also involved in, in animal agriculture. So to me, the reason this is so big, and I know we all have to devote our lives to where our consciousness is sending us, and we're all on exactly the right track in that. The great thing about going vegan is you take these huge steps towards saving the planet when you were just going to be eating anyway. It doesn't take anything away from other interests, other causes. It's just, you know, you order something different for lunch. And then it also, I really believe, Suzanne, that what we eat is the most intimate relationship that we have. So we take into ourselves either death and suffering and pain or life and beauty and color and phytochemicals and all this great stuff. And so over time, you know, they used to say seven years, all your cells change. Over time, we are interacting in a physical way with a physical vehicle created from life and love instead of from death and suffering. And that's got to go really far to raising consciousness. I think that's really brilliant. And I want to make a, a confession. When I was watching your movie, it's going to make me cry, uh, and they were showing how um, greenhouse gases or you know all of the things that global warming um, is uh, so dangerous about and, and how animal um, you know farming and uh, raising animals is actually such a great contributor. I actually, now, you know, <laughs> this is like no big deal that, oh, I started thinking, but I am such a committed meat eater that when I was watching that, I thought, well, maybe, maybe we should just stop doing that, all of us. And boy, if we could shift the whole global warming thing, and then, you know, we'd all learn how to make the most delicious vegan dishes and, you know, what have you, that that could really be major and it wouldn't hurt anybody, you know? It would just give us, you know, we'd give up what we perceive to be some pleasure, which I do, you know, I like that. But I did start thinking, wow, Maybe that's what we really should do. I don't know, Victoria, you may have me on your bandwagon uh, 100% before uh, you know, we're finished in this game of life. So I don't we're know. We're so much on the same bandwagon anyway. Nothing would surprise me. Well, that's what I said. You know, it's underneath it all. There's beingness. And oh, God, you know, I'm in love with your beingness. Uh, what do you think, Victoria? Do you think that humanity is going to make it? I mean, big question. I'm sure we're going to make it in some way. I don't think every single human will be wiped out. But I think that if we don't get really, really serious about climate and pollution and, and these other things that are going on with the planet, that there are going to be grave changes that no one wants, certainly none of us who have children or, or grandchildren or, or care about future generations wants, so I think it's dire. I also think it's doable. And, and I, I think we just need to, to just get on that moving walkway and, and start really devoting our lives to preserving this planet. And something that one of the rabbis, I think, was saying in A Prayer for Compassion was that in the Jewish faith, it's actually against a religious tenet to extinct a species. And the prediction is that over the next 10 years, we're going to be extincting thousands and thousands and thousands of them, and then potentially ourselves. So let's just not do that. Yeah. <laughs> you know? let, us, let us change, you know, and it's a day at a time. And I think we have to be so kind to ourselves as we make any kind of change. And we're all different people. So whatever it is that we're doing to live in a more environmentally friendly way, if we're going to change the diet, some people is like, okay, you know, I've learned this information, I'm done, I, you know, tomorrow I'm, I'm vegan and I'm turning the lights off and I leave a room and, you know, all that. And other people, they need to do things a little more slowly. 
And that's okay. And if you make some giant change and it just doesn't feel right and you feel kind of energetically off, then back up a little bit and make it more slowly because we're in this for the long haul. This is important. This isn't like some kind of thing of, you know, the nine day wonder diet. This is about saving the planet and helping to raise the consciousness of humanity. And also it's about a liberation movement. When we bring the animals in, this is the first liberation movement in the history of the world in which the oppressed group cannot participate. So we're totally doing it for them. You know, I mean, you and I were around to see the civil rights movement and we know that a lot of white people went and, and helped with, you know, the, the legal changes and the things that needed to happen at that time for African Americans. Certainly we're not done with that one either. But basically, the people who were oppressed were at the forefront of that movement. In animal rights, the animals can't be at the forefront of the movement. So it's all about us. So we've got so many exciting, planet-shifting, incredible things ahead of us that even though we could also focus on, oh my gosh, it's looking kind of Armageddon-like, and certainly every movie that comes out of Hollywood just about, you think Armageddon was inevitable, and yet on the other hand, there's so much we can do by doing just what you've been saying for your whole career, which is expand your consciousness, rise above the way we've always thought and the way we've always done, and live in a way that is going to turn this thing around because it's not too late. Well, you know, just even sitting here talking to you, Victoria, I'm just getting this wash of after you get through all the, oh, the morality and it's terrible what we do to the animals and you got health concerns. But when you get to the possibility of the extinction of humanity and uh, global warming and that really a massive shift, not, not this incremental, which is a whole other category of individuals tuning in. But when you get to this massive idea about what could actually save the world, you know, and switching, I have never really thought of it uh, in that very focused way. And I'm going to start thinking about that now. You, I think you got a new convert here. Yeah. Yeah. Well, one powerful convert. <laughs> really, really. Okay. Under advisement. Um, Victoria, I asked about whether you have a one line message for the world. I think we could, I, I'm thinking that you've given such a rich kind of body of information here that, you know, we don't need to belabor it and keep talking about this because really I think this is a wonderful, um, you know, set of ideas and, um, and, and excitement about what you're up to that we've conveyed here. Um, have, have you thought about a one line message for the world? We are collecting those. Oh, thank you. Okay, here's mine. Eat kindly, live wisely, make a difference. Oh, I want a bumper sticker. <laughs> <laughs> so, Victoria, you know, I could talk to you all night, and sometimes we do, but not now. <laughs> <laughs> so we got to sign off here. And I am so happy that you've done this with me. This is early on, you know, in my podcast career. And uh, I think you've been a good feather in my small cap so far. I oh, appreciate you. Well, may it be incredibly successful. And I, I'm just, I'm always in awe of you. Nothing passes you by. Oh, sweetheart. You are such a good buddy. So over and out until we meet again, honey. Thank you so much for doing this podcast with me. Thank you. All the best. Now Suzanne takes your hand and she leads you to the river. So, dear listeners, thank you for tuning into this episode of Searching for Unity in Everything, Meaningful Conversations with Meaningful People. Do subscribe to our podcast so you don't miss any episodes. And check out suespeaks.org slash podcast for notes about this one. To make any comments on it, go to our blog on suespeaks.org where we made a post about this episode. How did you feel about what you heard? Did you learn anything? Or were you inspired to act in any new way? Or do you perhaps disagree with anything that was said? Also, while you're on our website, do explore and comment on some of the other content. There's a cup of consciousness for everyone. And you want to travel with her And you want to travel blind And you know you can trust her For she's touched your perfect body with her mind